um, the thing that broke fear off my life as a worship leader was just that it was getting up on stage and loving the people that I was leading and wanting to see them get their breakthrough, wanting to see God move on their behalf, wanting to, to, to reach into heaven as a worship leader and pull down, oh, just what was needed in that room, you know, and obviously worship is unto the Lord. Um, but when he comes, like, like we, we, I think Brian and Katie Torrell have this incredible song. When you walk into the room, oh, yeah. sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist. I think that that would be what, like, I'm like, to be completely captivated by God's heart in such a way where you, you love the people that he loves because he, he is love. What's up, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Trevor Talks. I'm your host, Trevor Tyson, and as per usual, I'm just excited to be here. It's one of those things where I'm like, do we actually get to record a show and people listen to it? And for some amazing reason, we're all here and we made it. And I'm super excited for today's episode in particular because today's guest is an amazing worship leader, songwriter, and most notably a part of the Bethel Music Collective. And honestly, I feel obligated to create a new title for her because after listening to this record, The Field, I'm like, she's a conversationalist. And so we're going to throw conversationalists in there. In her latest album, The Field, she invited us all on a sweet, intimate journey with her into trusting God despite our views or distractions that we may have within us, around us, or within our own hearts. And I'm beyond thrilled to have her on the show today. Please help me welcome Miss Christine DeMarco. Christine, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me, Trevor. Dude, of course. It's like, you know what? We're going to do an intro and I'm not going to butcher it. So yes. I might have, but I don't feel like I did. What do you no, think? No, that was great. That was an awesome intro. I love that. Conversationalist. Awesome. I'm going to add that awesome. to my bio. <laughs> Look, I'm dead serious. Like after listening to this, and I've listened to it probably about three times today, um, it's unique. Mm -hmm. It's conversational and it's inviting people to a piece of you that is very vulnerable. So I guess yeah. we could just start off with talking about how did this album come mm -hmm. to fruition? When did you start concepting this thing? And it's yeah. almost like it came out of left field because this is almost a folk rockish type sound, which isn't the normal for you. And yeah. I was excited to hear it. I was like, yeah, come on. But where did this all start? Um, <clears throat> I'd say that it started like a lot of things started for us in 2020, you know, mm -hmm. I was actually, I had been writing for an album in 2019. They, they had said like, Oh, we have you like on the docket for 2021, you know, it's just, so I was like, okay, I'm just going to start writing. So I just started writing and feeling a little less inspired. Um, but then 2020, 2020 hit and, um, it was a very interesting year for me because I think I, I don't know if any, anybody out there really follows the Enneagram at all, but for me, um, whatever your views are on personality tests, but for me, I'm a one. And so I can be really highly perfectionistic and I'm hardly, I can be hard on myself. I can be hard on a lot of other people. And I'm, uh, I, I call myself, I'm like, God is sanctifying that part of me for sure. Mm -hmm. And so when 2020 hit, I, my opinion started just raging, just like, I think most people would say, if I didn't have opinions before, now I have opinions, you know, and I, it just felt pretty loud and all quietness, um, that maybe started with the pandemic just went out the window in the summertime and everybody is very loud. Um, and as we know, like some people are right, some people are wrong. And I think that, of course, I was right all the time. <laughs> Just, yeah, as I'm sure many of you were. <clears throat> as we all are. As we all are. <laughs> yes. And I, I remember um, I had had a bunch of songs for the album at that point already. And I took them into the studio. And um, one of our drummers, David Whitworth, was like, hey, I feel like there's more inside of you that needs to come out. Like, this is nice but there's more like, why don't you start to be more honest? And so I'm like, fine, I'll be more honest, you know? And I, I think at first when I started writing for this project, 
I thought that I was going to write a project that would show everybody how wrong they were and how right I was. Um, and I, that's me being completely vulnerable was like, okay, I'm going to be the person to show everybody the way. And I think it is some level. It's like, I, you want to dream big, right? You want to, you don't want to think that what you make can't actually change the world. You really should believe that you should believe deeply in yourself. But I think for me, my attitude wasn't super helpful or super great, but um, over the course of writing. So I, I obviously didn't release it in 2021, but over the course of the waiting from uh, 2020 into 2022, the songs that started coming out of me were, it was as if the Lord was cutting away at my, at the rough edges of my heart. And I would describe it like I grew up in Niagara Falls, New York, and I would always describe it as this rock that we would, my family and I would go to this special place down by the Niagara River. And I mean, you go out 20 feet and there's rapids, you know, like intense raging rapids. And I remember watching this one rock as a kid and watching it get smaller and smaller and smaller until it disappeared under the water altogether before I left Niagara Falls. And I felt like the Lord had was almost saying, you are this rock and stay in the river. Let me run over you. Let me change you. Let me soften you. And so this whole, this project and what it became was the softening of me. And as it started being unpacked, I realized this isn't just, this couldn't possibly just be for me. I feel like God really is going after his church um, because he's in constant pursuit of his church no matter how embarrassing, no matter how stinky and how many things we do in his name that actually aren't about him at all. Um, he is in constant pursuit of us. And so I, I, when I wrote, what if Jesus, that's probably one of my favorite songs I've ever written. Um, it's heavily influenced by Bob Dylan, who is one of my favorite songwriters of all time. I've been listening to him since 2005, I'd say. Wow. And just for the most part, not really digging into his lyrics that much, you know, just really enjoying it. Like, what is this? Um, anyway, it was influenced by that and this, the sound of the 60s and the civil rights movement and the songs that were coming out of this really tumultuous time in our human American history. And so I'm thinking this feels like a tumultuous time in our history with the pandemic, with a lot of like civil unrest, stuff that was happening um, especially, uh, in, in politics. Yeah. And so I, I said, I remember sitting down, um, or making my coffee one morning and I was, I was like, God, who's right and who's wrong? <laughs> like, Jesus, I need you to tell me right now. And I felt, I felt this, uh, this still small voice say, well, you're all a little bit wrong. Wow. And it was this beautiful moment just of humbling and also almost like, it made me feel connected again to the world, connected again to people who didn't agree with me. And I'm like, Oh, we're all a little bit wrong. Like we all see in part, we really don't have it all figured out. And I sat down, I wrote, what if Jesus and specifically the line in it where it says, what if his body bridges the chasms I've dug out in my own self-righteousness? That's my favorite line. I think in the entire album, because it hit me so hard. It was as if somebody punched me in the stomach, like realizing <laughs> in the best way, kind of like yeah. wake up, like snap out of it. Um, it was this beautiful moment where I realized that my, my goal to be right and to be correct was not his goal, mm -hmm. that he cared much more about connection and relationship than the correctness and just realizing how much weight I had put upon facts and all of, all of that stuff that he didn't actually have that same weight that yeah. he was, he was, while I was separating myself from the people I was embarrassed by or the people that I was like, you are so wrong and you're racist or you're this, you know? Um, I was putting this huge chasm between me and them and I was standing on one side and pointing my finger at the other side, watching as 
in this visual watching as Jesus is laying his body across that divide. Because um, in Isaiah, it says in his righteousness, he draws near. And I believe that the reason why he doesn't like our righteousness, he says it's like dirty rags, because I believe in our righteousness, we pull away, we create distance, we create space. And it's, it's completely different than true righteousness, which is the righteousness of God. Um, so that, that's a good, I'd say a good summary of the entire project. It's uh, obviously called The Field, and I named it that because it felt like I found this incredible treasure of the kindness of God that yeah. he is committed to me um, and that it will keep on coming. I'll keep digging up more and more of his kindness. And he, yeah. sometimes it cuts, but that's okay. So, yeah. And that's beautiful. Like uh, one thing that I had noted was when I saw the album cover for the first time, like and read the field, I was like, it reminds me of a sacred place someplace like we all have that one place where we want to go to where nobody's going to find us it's just us and god yeah. and you captured that and the emotion from the record like one of the lines and one of the songs which i'll butcher it i don't know like the specific lyric but uh, like yeah the, yeah you can i think you wrote it so i think you can yeah. help here so when the people that are disagreeing with you are the ones that are washing jesus's feet with perfume yes that That's is good. so real and especially like you're being vulnerable and you're admitting like, Hey, I was distancing myself from people that I didn't agree with hundred percent politically. And mm -hmm. I think we've all done that to our fault in some way, shape or form, especially during the pandemic, we were all locked in our homes. You've got yeah. all this political unrest. You've got race issues. You've got a presidential campaign going berserk, like yes, or both sure. of them, you know, yeah. there was so much unrest and it got to a point where I was like, I don't even want to watch the news. And then now yeah. it's almost as if, unfortunately, we're getting to a point where we're so used to seeing like school shootings and such on the news mm -hmm. that it doesn't. Yeah. It almost doesn't affect it us. Yeah. Did. And it's like, Oh, that happened there. That happened there. And it's like, I'm not here to talk about like gun reform or anything, but like, <laughs> There's be a whole different podcast. Yeah. Like yeah. it's, it's yeah, getting it's, hard and it's so hard, mm -hmm, but totally. you were able to navigate that and put it into songs, which mm -hmm. was beyond encouraging for me. Like, and as I said, it doesn't sound like what you would expect from a Christine DeMarco record or something from mm -hmm. Bethel, which I mean, when Stephanie Gretzinger came out with blackout, we're just like, Whoa, where did that come from? It's the same thing. <laughs> sure. It's a yeah. whole, sound and I appreciate it and I love it so much and again like we've all been in that place where we're like mm -hmm. you're wrong I'm right but throughout this record one of the reoccurring themes is like we're probably all wrong in some yeah. way shape or form and that's okay yeah why is why is it that we're not allowing Jesus to restructure us in that way yeah and no, it's refreshing it's like seriously it is. And mm -hmm. I keep going back to it because when people listen to a podcast, they want to take something away. And I hope that if there's one thing that we can all get out of this talk, it's that it's okay to not have all the answers. It's okay to disagree with someone, but have a mm -hmm. discussion about it, write an album yeah. about it. Like, I don't know, yeah, like right do <laughs> try to bridge the gap with Christ and you've done that. So with all of that being said, you have obviously, and you can decline this or whatever, mm -hmm. but you've grown into an amazing lady. Thank and you. we've all obviously all heard your version of it as well. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I guess been stuck in my head all day. But it hasn't always been that way. Like before yeah. the millions of views and worship leading in front of thousands of people, like there was simply just Christine there. And mm -hmm. that same girl is still in you. And one thing that I like to point out is we're all just normal people Then God's called us to do some extraordinary things. So with that being said, before you um, did the Jesus Culture record and then went on mm -hmm. to Bethel and creating albums, where did it start for you? Was music always the vision that God has given you? Or was this a journey that you're still on to this day? Um. It's a great question. I'll try to I'll I'll try to get all the good parts in that in the answer. When I <laughs> I'd say um, I've loved singing since I was a little girl, and my mom has pictures of me like 
belting it out to Sandy Patty, you know, just standing on a stool with a hairbrush, you know, just a little toddler really. And I, and it, it was so simple back then. And it was just the feeling of singing. It was the feeling of like it floating out of your, out of your vocal cords, you know, and it just coming out. And, um, I, I was this five-year-old little kid. I was, they tell me that they would put me up um, on stage to sing little solos in the Christmas plays at church because I was like the only five-year-old that had to hold a tune and not go flat or not go sharp or something. So they'd be like, we'll have Christine do it. And I was, I was extraordinarily brave when it came to singing. Um, when it came to speaking, not so much. I was very, very shy. And so but when I, it was, there was no shame when it came to singing. I'm like, I have, I have everything it takes to do this. <laughs> um, and that, um, I kind of grew out of that, honestly, when it came to adolescence and being a teenager, you know, I was, I was scared out of my mind to sing, absolutely terrified. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't sing in front of anybody. Um, it, which was very different than when I was five, six, seven, eight, you know? And so like, I, I remember joining the worship team, but only for keys. So I would play piano and I was on the, I was, I played piano from the time I was 13 to the time I was about 15 years old, just piano. And we had this new worship leader come into town. We were a church of probably 150 people. It's pretty small. And it was actually right down the street from where I lived. And so I, my dad would give me the keys cause he was the assistant pastor and I would, I would go in and at night I'd turn on the sound system and I'd just sing. And that's the only time I would sing <laughs> in front of people. But it's we like had nobody's new, here. It's nobody's fine. here. It's fine. I think I sound good. I'm not really sure. I was just super insecure. Um, and we had this new door player come in and he was a little bit, he like was in a band and he was like kind of edgy. Um, and I was playing keys for him. And one day our worship leader, a girl worship leader just got sick, didn't show up. And he's like, he looks at me, he's like, you're singing. And I'm like, I don't sing. I play piano. <laughs> he's like, yes, you sing. You're singing. And, you know, a small church, right? It's like, well, you're taking over our songs. <laughs> we don't you're even do this, this, it. this, and this. We don't have somebody to do lights, but we need you to lead yeah, worship. Yeah. So do it with your toes. Yeah. If you so can. you're doing it. <laughs> Sorry. And I'm like, oh my God. I was oh, so, I was shaking. I was terrified. And it was this song, I think by passion, um, it was this version of amazing grace. Yeah. And I, I, I was shaky and I sang it. I sang this, sang this whole song. And I remember at the end wanting to go run and cry. But af at that moment, I got so much positive feedback and so much encouragement. Um, people were coming up to me and saying, like, your voice is amazing. You have to keep doing this. And that's that's the thing, isn't it? Like, you step out and do something. And if there's nobody there to encourage you, would you ever step on stage again and do it? I don't think so. Sure. Encouragement sure. for new leaders is is vital. Um, and so I got so much encouragement. I'm like, Hey, maybe, maybe this is who I, maybe this is what I want. And I, cause I still loved it. I love singing. So I, I continued to sing. I became the youth worship leader, the assistant worship leader in my church by the time I was 18. And when I graduated high school, I, um, all I wanted to do was just seek the Lord. I, I had I had it in my head that I wanted to do something with music, something with worship, but I didn't know how am I supposed to make money with this? How am I supposed to build anything with this? You know, everybody said, go into art, be an architect, be this, you know, I'm like, but I feel like it's on my life to do this. So I ended up going to IHOP Kansas City, which is the International House of Prayer, nope. not pancakes. Um, and Global. I went, <laughs> Global house of prayer. Yes. I did not realize what I got myself into. It was a lot of prayer room time. Um, I did fire in the night internship, which we, we basically would wake up at 3 PM in the afternoon. We would go into the prayer room at midnight, have lunch at 2 PM, 2 AM. And then, you know, it was just a weird schedule and I did it yeah. for six months I was a part of the worship teams there. So I decided I'm going to try out for worship teams. I funny thing. I tried out for keys and vocal. I didn't make it for keys, but I made it for vocal there you and go. I became, um, I became a prayer room singer, prophetic singer. <laughs> and I, uh, that was quite the, 
the training ground because you people would be up there praying and then you'd have to like listen to what they're praying and then come up with something to sing off of what they were praying. That really prepared me for Bethel music, let me tell you. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, um, sure. <laughs> yeah, like our 50-minute songs, you know? I learned that just stuff. Just 50. Like, yeah, just 50. Just 50. That's fine. I learned that by doing the house prayer stuff. And I fell in love with it. I fell in love with being just in the presence of God that long and just sitting in it. And sure, like I, cr- my fingers cramped after a while and my voice got hoarse sometimes. Um but I, and then I joined the call with Lou Engel, um, stood in front of the Supreme Court, life tape on my mouth, praying for the ending of abortion. Um, did that for 10 months, was in Washington, D.C. I sat in on the, the, um, the confirmation hearings of Justice John Roberts, just did some really weird things. like Just the random um, things that nobody would think things. of. That's awesome. Yeah. And I'm like, I can't believe I got to do that. That's pretty cool to get that, to be that close to government. Mm-hmm. And then we would pray. And I was one of four worship leaders going 24 seven. And so you imagine that's about a six hour set and with a little break in the middle to pray um, at the Supreme court. But I started doing very long marathon worship sets. And uh, now I, I think two hours is probably my max, <laughs> but I, I hit 13 hours at one point leading worship. That's wow. my record. That's like an entire day that your toddler's awake, you know? <laughs> that is a lot of people's records by a long shot. I don't yeah, think I, I think can say I've done anything close to 13 hours. I haven't met anybody so far that's like, I broke your record, 16. Well, David's tent in DC, they'd go for like 24 hours, but I don't know if that's like one individual. I, would, yeah, I doubt I don't, it. But, I like to but, think that's not one individual because nobody, yeah. like I had a hard time saying no back then. I'm really glad that I built up some boundaries. <laughs> But, That's uh, me over the past few years. Like, mm, can't do it right now. Sorry. <laughs> yes, exactly. Like there is an element of, hey, this doesn't make you holier. Just, you know, <laughs> relax. Yeah. I think I was I was definitely in the thralls of like, I'm so holy and righteous and I must keep going. I must Fire do it. In the altar, yeah. Fire in the altar, right? never go out. God really has worked on my heart. But Come I on. did that. Um, moved to San Francisco, started a house of prayer out in San Francisco, which is how I ended up in California. Um, that was the hardest three years of my life. Uh, the the Where His Light Was album really is a, came out of that. It was about that. Um, and I think that I did like kind of a mini documentary a yeah. bit about that. So if it, people want to dive into that a little more. We're going to put it, the link for that in the description because I do okay. want to talk about that, especially the little apartment and you. Oh, yeah. All the encounters you had were phenomenal. Yeah, yeah we, I mean, when you're, there is nothing quite like being in a place where, um, where it's, it's, it can be so dark at certain points that I, I kind of describe it as you shut off all the lights in a room, um, and you light a candle, that candle is incredibly bright, right? Yeah. Sometimes when you light a candle in broad daylight, you don't notice it as much, but something about being in that city I noticed the kingdom of heaven everywhere I would go. I would see him in everything. And I, I miss it sometimes. I'm in a very peaceful, peaceful city, peaceful place. And I think I, it's easier to miss the kingdom of heaven sometimes when there isn't, I mean, when you're not confronted with darkness all the time. Um, it's an interest, I guess maybe an interesting thing to say, but I believe that it burns all the brightest in dark, dark places. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I met God in San Francisco. I, cool. Nobody can convince me that he's not real because I'm like, no, I actually, I met him. My daughter is at this stage in her life where she's like, Mom, I just don't know. And I remember being in that place. And I was like, well, Lorelai, do you hope? Do you hope that he's real? And she's like, yeah, I hope. I was like, good. Cause that's the, all you can do because it says faith is a gift of God through Jesus Christ. And I'm telling you, God gave me faith and he'll give you faith. It's just like, we think we have to like conjure up something, but it's like, hold on to your hope. Don't lose hope. And he'll meet it with his faith. You know? Um, yeah. I, so that's what that place was for me. It was like my hoping that he was real 
and him meeting me with a knowing that he was mm. alive and real. And um, I mean, and a lot of people pray for that. They're like, God, give me that sign. And one of the things that really stuck out to me about um, seeing you lead worship, I'll have like the Bethel YouTube channel just going on repeat while I'm working throughout the day. And one thing that really stands out to me is you have this it's almost a presence of fearless worship. And I was very curious about that and hearing the mm -hmm. story behind like, yeah, like you've had people literally putting curses on you in the streets and you're still <laughs> leading worship. And you're like, God, like you told me to be here. I'm quite anxious. Yeah. I don't feel good. I don't want to be here. And all that's in the documentary, which again, we'll put mm -hmm. in the description below. Like it's, it's interesting because you yeah. see people on stage leading worship and it's so easy, especially in the celebrity like church culture, quote unquote, to be like, oh, they're superhuman or this or that. No, they're human. Mm -hmm. They're literally just that's what they do in their alone time. Like you see yeah. them off stage nine times out of 10. If somebody's charismatic on stage, you see them in the crowd somewhere. They're going to be going ham mm -hmm. just as hard, <laughs> like yeah. running around. I remember I was at a charismatic um, <laughs> gathering a few uh, like a year ago and people were like there were old ladies that were dancing around like fairies and I'm like, y'all get it. You know, like that's, that's <laughs> you're doing it. You're doing it. Yes, big. Charismatic. It's, it's a, it's a whole nother level <laughs> flags and uh, yes, painters flags. and it's so fires. Well, it's encouraging because it mm -hmm. shows like worship comes in all different forms. Sure and does, especially yeah. when it comes down to like that quote unquote fearless worship, it had to take a while to get to that point mm -hmm. where you're like, I don't care what people think like this may look yeah. weird, but this is just how I was wired to be. And yeah. I live in Georgia, which is obviously down in the deep South. Yes. And you don't see that quite as much. And a lot of people are even afraid to raise their hands during worship. So mm -hmm. not that we're like talking people into it, but sure. was there a breakthrough that you had to have personally where you're just like, I don't care. This is a surrender. This is a worship. Mm -hmm. This is how you have called me to be and yeah. how did you break through that anxiousness that you might have had that's that's a good question um for me i think initially i would have said oh i don't care what i don't care what people think and i think we a lot of people say this all the time you know and it's the th that's that's funny because it's it's like it's what i want deeply is to not care but when we try to do it in our own strength it tends to come off as rebellion or like we, anything really in our own strength isn't always great. And it comes off like that. Or we just dismiss people. We were like, I don't care what you think. And therefore I don't care about you. And what's interesting about uh, fear. Well, it says in the Bible, we've read this. We've all read this where it says perfect love casts out fear. And I'm here to tell you that it's, it's no different when you are leading people in worship. So if I'm up there and I'm like, I don't care about all of you. I don't care what you think <laughs> in my own strength, just trying to make it through. I am going to be just basically in fear anyway, because I'm not moving in love. Um, the thing that broke fear off my life as a worship leader was just that it was getting up on stage and loving the people that I was leading and wanting to see them get their breakthrough wanting to see God move on their behalf, wanting to, to, to reach into heaven as a worship leader and pull down, oh, just what was needed in that room, you know, and obviously worship is unto the Lord. Um, but when he comes, like, like we, we, I think Brian and Katie Torrell have this incredible song. When you walk into the room, oh, yeah. sickness starts to vanish. Every hopeless situation ceases to exist. I think that that would be what, pe like, I'm like, to be completely captivated by God's heart in such a way where you, you love the people that he loves because he, he is love. And so that broke the fear of man off my life. Like nothing else was not this. I don't care what you think thing, but it was like, I don't care what you think, but I do care about yeah. you. And, and, and I need Jesus and you need Jesus. And that's what, that's, we're both going to go after him today. Amen. You know, and then that, <laughs> that helped a lot. Um, I would say a big thing, especially I, I watch leaders and worship leaders get promoted really fast. And I think God can do that. He can use it. I don't think it's the easiest way to do it, 
Um, but for me, what helped is as my history with the Lord was built and as my, my, um, the song, I will rise, I wrote it a while back. And it's kind of based on that whole, that idea is like in the quiet of the morning when no one knew and no one needed to like this, this, what God built with me in the the times and the secret places where nobody was watching, nobody was seeing like those moments in your life, they build who you are and you bring them on stage with you. Like when I get on stage, I bring my entire history with God with me. I have this relationship. I have this history with him. I bring it on stage. I don't, I don't come onto the stage alone. Like I bring our relationship. I bring our history. And I, f- I feel like over the course of time um, that that is my confidence. Like I've had vocal struggles. I've had vocal problems. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've literally gotten on stage it, at Bethel and been like, we're just going to roll the dice today, you know, and I've lost all confidence in my vocal at one point. And God was like, I just want you to watch and see what I can do with someone who loses no confidence in me, even when losing confidence in their gift. And I, I'm like, no matter what, I, wherever, whatever stage I'm on or whatever stage I'm not on, it's like, I bring my history with God and, um, it's my greatest treasure and it is, it's the the rock on it that I stand on. So I'd say I, I watch really beautiful voices get promoted really early and I don't envy them. Um, I think that that's the harder way to do it. Um, it, it causes a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. God, I've watched God use it though. So yeah. I, he can use whatever the heck he wants, you know? So yeah. he's, he's used, uh, Avalon in my life. <laughs> so he's, he's used Christian radio. He's used everything. He's, he's used everything I thought he couldn't use. So I'm like, well, you know what? Um, I don't envy them, but yeah. I know God can use them. I love it. And that's the same thing with anything. Like you can get promoted way too quick and I can't sing worth a crap. So I'm not all volunteering for worship anytime soon. But <laughs> when I first started like, okay, God, you want to do something with my voice. I know you want to, like, I don't know what it is, but I'm so glad he didn't give me a platform when I wanted it because sure, I would have butchered every single aspect of it. Yeah. Um, and even now it's like, all right, God, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Like, why are we recording these? Like, why is this a thing? Like, yeah. give me your will, like your will be done. And it's refreshing to hear that it's not only worship leaders. It's not only people on a platform that happens with everybody. And yeah. it's something that we can all bond over. Like, Hey, we don't have it all together. Like your voice, like sometimes my voice isn't going to work. That's totally fine. And if God wants to give us a season of rest, look at it as that he's blessing you with a season to rest. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I struggle with like crazy. I cannot rest my mind. Mm -hmm. It's just always moving. Like I got to be doing something. We've got to be booking this. We got to do that. Like there's always Mm -hmm. something to do in my head. And I'm like, well, I'm going to hit a brick wall again. And I've learned like over time and I'm not perfect at it, but I am working at it. Like, okay, I got to slow down. I've got to pace myself. It's a marathon, not a sprint. If God wants me to do this tomorrow, it's going to happen tomorrow. If he wants it in 10 years, that's when it's going to happen. And diving kind of like back into the record, we've talked about what if Jesus, Mm -hmm. one of the songs that I'd really like to just give you the four to discuss is wherever you lead, because the lyrics, the lyrical content throughout the whole record is amazing but this song in particular just stopped me in my tracks and i was like i've got to hear the process for this i need to hear the Mm -hmm. story behind it i need to basically feel like i wrote it by the time we're done with this so yeah i would love to talk about that song um it's one of my favorites i think i've ever written or been a part of writing um it, it i wrote it in july 2020 and uh it i don't know if you've ever talk to Ethan Hulse. He actually helped Josh Baldwin write, um, stand in your love. Oh, and, amazing. Uh, so I got to write with him and he's like, I was just, he, it was through zoom, you know, cause, mm-hmm. cause of COVID and everything. And so we're, he, he, he's like, I was just looking out my window this morning and I started singing this and he goes, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus walking. With-. And he just kind of, he sings through almost the whole chorus. And I'm like, 
oh my gosh, you know, this is, yes, can we please write this song? Let's write this. Um, and he, so uh, we, I, I had the idea for the first verse, I'm done trusting in what's sinking. These boats weren't built for me. Mm-hmm. Um, that particular one, because I had been saying this, mauling around with this and in my head because of like the political unrest was asking God, like, do I get into a boat? Um, it just, if you, if you look at both parties as boats and both have holes and both are in the process of sinking, maybe one's sinking faster than the other, but they both have holes. Do you get into a sinking boat? <laughs> and I, I was almost like I was, I was talking to the Lord. I'm standing on the edge of the sea of Galilee or something. And I'm like, but the boats are messed up. And he's like, well, then you walk on water. And this idea of that there is a there is a better way. Like even when Jesus was on earth and they all wanted him to do one thing. You know, they, they wanted him to like overthrow Rome. They wanted him to do all this stuff, become king. Uh I mean, the, the list was endless of what they wanted their Messiah to do. And he did. He he came from a different kingdom with different rules, and he ultimately set all the captives free and the whole world free. Um, so it's a, th- it, I feel like this term is overused a lot, but the third way, um, I think that uh, this song was started to be that exactly exact thing of, I'm going to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to walk with the one who walks on the sea. I'm going to give my life to follow, speak to me and I'll go wherever you lead. Um, it's this, this fresh commitment to the Lord. Like I follow Jesus. Um, the, the second verse being, I'm done trusting an image of what only looks like me. It's this idea of I'm done trusting in my idea of God and a God who always agrees with what I think I'm like, he, he is much bigger than my thought process. He's much bigger than what I've made him to be. I'm done trusting in my image, um, of God. It was that idea of the golden calf in the Bible when they were worshiping the golden calf, they were calling it like Yahweh. They were, they were, they created it not as almost a different God. They created it as like an image of the God that they couldn't quite comprehend. And I'm like, I just, I don't want to worship an image of something that makes sense to me. Um, um, Surrounding youth limits. Uh, I want to make sure I like God, would you forgive me and restore the mystery? That thing that irritates us sometimes mostly about, about God is the mystery of, of who he is. Cause we want to figure everything out. Right. Yeah. But God restore the mystery. Mm. Uh, it's just that thought really, really got at my heart when we were writing and the, um, the bridge, um, wherever you go, wherever you lead, that's where I'll go. That's where I'd be very simple thought, but it's just this recommitment to the Lord. I th- I thought that it was a good heartbeat for the entire record being yeah. like, I'm just done trusting in what's sinking. Yeah. Um, I'm done equating certain political parties with r- righteousness. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm done. I'm finished. God, I, I want only you like, I will follow you. And, and it, it was, it's humbling. Cause it's like our, our natural tendencies would be get in a boat. <laughs> you have to pick sides. You must be on a team. And I'm like, I, I don't feel like I am. Um, so that's basically what the song is about and where it came from. I love that. And the last one I really want to touch on is you yeah. are my country. And the first thing yeah. about it that really, stopped me was the sound and the flow Mm -hmm. that you have in this song it's very again just like the whole record this is very new a very new sound for you and the message of this song just like you are my country everybody wants to be patriotic everybody wants to be on the right side of history quote unquote but god hasn't called us to be republican or democrat he's called Mm -hmm. us to be like just believe in him like believe that he's got a better will and it reminded me of that saying that like I hear a lot of family talk about God doesn't want a pastor to be the president of the United States it's like oh, yeah, 
yeah, that's cool. Like <laughs> everybody's got their thing, but you are my country just to read off the first line. Like maybe we'll get to heaven and realize we were both wrong. Who can throw the sharpest stone, build the biggest throne? Is there really a winner if we all have broken bones? Maybe we will get to heaven and realize we are both wrong. We're all just slapping wrists over why we exist. Everybody's Arminian and everyone's a Calvinist. Can we tell God a man-made king from a man-made king? Can we tell love from a promise ring? Can we tell the kingdom from the kingdom where we lay our head down at night? All the imagery in it is so perfect. Mm-hmm. I could read through the whole thing, but I'm not going to for time's sake. Like, yeah. where did the song start? Where mm-hmm. was the inspiration for this? And anything else you want to share? Like, I'm just at yeah. a loss for words again, reading it just because this is exactly what needed to be said. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. honestly, that is a song that I didn't think I'd be allowed to record, you know, or it was just that idea of like, can I really say this? Like, can I say it? Um, I have this really great friend named Gable Price who helped me write this song. And he's one of my favorite people to write with. Um, I remember te- we were texting back and forth in 2020. And I I had told him about, like, I asked the Lord who was right and who's wrong. And he said, we're all a little bit wrong. And he's like, that's crazy. Cause I started this song and he, and he ha- actually had the first line. Maybe we'll get to heaven and realize we we're both wrong. And I'm like, let's write the song. And so, um, he, he comes over, uh, we're in my music room and we actually wrote that song and idol idols the same day, two hours. That's all took it, wrote both of the songs, but this one in particular, um, I, like I, I have to hand give Gable a lot of credit because he has way more guts than I do in a lot of ways. He he's in a position where I feel like he has a lot more permission to like explore lyrics and stuff. But I, I really grabbed onto this idea of maybe we're both wrong, and we unpacked the who can throw the sharpest stone, you know? Because it's like if what it's like is it is the person who throws the sharpest stone are they the most right? Like, or is it, is it actually a loss? You know, is it, Robert, is it really a winner if we all have broken bones? Um, going on to the, everyone's Arminian, everyone's a Calvinist. Obviously those two theologies are on opposite spectrums and starting to be like, well, everybody falls in somewhere in this, this spectrum, right? Um, and uh, kind of like tongue in cheek, a little bit sassy. And I think, <laughs> I think the, the beat of the song, the way that it, it, it is produced really lends itself to that. Um, the idea, can we tell God from a man-made King was really based in my, I'd say some of it came from my frustration of 2020 of like mm-hmm. seeing, like being like, we, we have put too much hope in man. Yeah. Like, like, I don't think I'm a hundred percent correct, but our hope is misplaced. And even like, even when it comes to issues like ending abortion and things that are actually really important, I feel to the heart of God, um, poverty, all of these things, it's like, no one has a monopoly on justice and nobody has a monopoly on righteousness. And we're putting our, we're putting so much weight into Kings that we've made, like even in the Bible, when they, they wanted a King so bad. So they got Saul, you know, and, um, just mulling around with that in my head and um gable with uh can we tell love from a promise ring kind of this funny idea of like you know back in the day when all the girls had promise rings and (laughs) just the idea of like well that's that's like this weird it's not a real commitment you know um uh and i mean i could go on and on about that song like can can will i really find a savior on one side of a party line probably Mm -hmm. not um, the, there's actually a bridge in that song that I didn't put into my version, but Gable did a version of it and it goes really hard. It's like, and he's like, he's a little bit more like rock than I am, but it's like, I pledge allegiance to the presence, no matter what it costs. Cause the only war I'm begging for was finished on the cross. Um, it's, it's like, it goes really hard into like, you are my country and, that's, that's the reality is like when I gave my life 
to Jesus Christ, everything else became secondary. And so Chris, like me, it, his kingdom became the rules and the standards by which I live my life. And America gladly gives me so many great rights and res- and responsibilities that I am very appreciative, of, especially as a woman. Um, but when it comes down to it, if God were to say, I need you to lay down that right, like, am I more Christian than I am American? You, like, does that make sense? Like, it, yeah. like what kingdom reigns inside of me most, most, you know, mostly. And I think that's the whole idea of the song is what kingdom wins when it comes down to it. Um, and even in uh, the idolatry song, like yeah. we all have these devices in our hands and I was thinking about it yesterday. I was like, I imagine in 10, 20 years, maybe even sooner that there's going to be statistics on how, what percentage of our lives that we're actually looking down at our devices versus what's in front of us. Sure. And that becomes a king to us if we don't nip it in the butt, like yeah. social media standards, uh, working, overworking, lack thereof, feeling as if our community is on our phone versus in person. Like there's a lot of mental health stuff that goes into that. And so many people right now feel so connected, but they're mm-hmm. lonely and they're isolated yeah. and they're suicidal and they don't necessarily know where to go. And segueing into this question, there's a lot of people out there that are feeling a lot of different ways, especially in politics, uh, whether they agree or disagree with the abortion um, decision for Roe versus Wade, whether yeah. they voted for Trump in 2020 and feel as if the election were stolen, whether like on all different sides of the spectrum, yes, a lot of people are feeling broken, afraid, betrayed, and the lo- it just goes on. So mm-hmm. for those people that might be listening into this right now, from you what would you say to them and just progressing yeah. to move forward and to heal from that heartache? Um, I, I think I just, to, maybe just to even pull on the song gravity from the album, that particular song, when it says like, don't let this truth be lost on me, my God, he feels the gravity of everything. I think about it as a parent. And when, you know, when you're, you're a kid, like an hour is like an eternity, you know, and that your perspective, it's because your perspective is so small. It's so limited. You haven't quite seen the world. You haven't, um, you haven't quite experienced a lot. And so your perspective is so small. Therefore time just tr- like crawls by. And I think about having one of the greatest, um, lessons as a parent is having grace for your kids that cannot see to the end of their noses, you know? And then they're like, they're like my iPad time limit went on and they're just like like cry, crying and bawling their eyes out. Like it's the worst thing that happened to them that day, you know? And, and you're like, my God, we need to take you to a third world nation, you know, or something because the perspective is so small. And I think about, um, I think about, the stuff that we're actually going through right now in the world, like people really, really struggling with some really intense stuff like depression, like um, hopelessness, pandemic, death, loss, all probably some of the, the hardest things you can deal with as a human being. But the, and I think sometimes I was, I was driving in 2020 and we were dealing with some stuff as a family. And I was like, God, are you just, are you just looking, you're just watching. Are you just up there? You know, like, cause it's, sometimes it just feels like that. Are you just watching? And, um, and as soon as it came out of my mouth, you know, I'm, I'm crying. And if that's when like the song gravity started just to drop into my heart of, my God, he feels the gravity of everything. And that even though you have this, this um, uncreated God who dwells outside of time and all of the things that it says about him in the Bible, that he would become flesh, that he would limit his perspective, that he would, he would clothe himself in skin, that he would come and feel the literal gravity of the earth on his body. 
Um, I just, I have found so much comfort in the man Jesus in this past couple years. And I know onto my, into my whole life is that when he raised from the dead, he, when it says that he walked through that wall and they're like, ah, a ghost. Um, he's like, no, 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 touch me, touch my hands. And it hit me so hard that he, his body, flesh and bone raised. And he still like, he, he, and we talk about it all the time, but it was like the spirit of revelation or something was on it. And I felt the weight of the fact that he is flesh and he is bone. And they even watched him eat. They're like, is it going to fall to the floor if he's eaten? You know, um, I would encourage people just that your God is flesh and bone because he chose to be flesh and bone. And that the gravity that you feel when it comes to the situations that you find yourself in and the gravity that you literally feel keeping your feet on the, the earth, this big rock in outer space, like he felt all of those things and he is not far off. Um, I, I found incredible comfort in that and that he has so much grace for our, our very limited perspective that he's not like, ah, oh, get over it, that he actually can feel with us, even though he has... He knows the beginning from the end. He feels with us, even in the middle of it. So that has been, that's a comfort. And I feel like that should comfort a lot of other people too. Man, oh man, Christine DeMarco, everybody. Jeez, you probably caught on to the fact that I was at a loss for words a few times because this record is so beautiful that I can't really describe it. And like the sound is great, but the lyrical content, there's something about it that just feels genuine, vulnerable. And it, I, I don't know if an interview can do it justice. So I hope that I did a decent job. You can let me know in the comments below if I need to work on anything. You know what? You be my critique. Let me know. Something you don't like, DM me. Uh -huh. But also like this is something that we're going to keep doing. Trevor Talks isn't going away. I'm super thrilled and honored to be able to have guests every single week. We're getting close to 100 episodes, which is very exciting. You never know who our 100th episode is going to be. In fact, I haven't even thought about that. So I'm going to get on that. But in the meantime, we love you guys so much. Be sure to check out The Field with the link in the description below, as well as that short documentary on Bethel Music's YouTube page, which we're also going to have in the description below. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Seriously, like a little old dude from Social Circle being able to do a show like this is a dream come true. And if you're listening to this right now, you were a part of that. So from the top bottom in my whole heart, thank you so much. And I cannot wait to bring you more content next week. So we'll talk to you then. And in the meantime, just know you're loved, you have purpose, and that God has a specific plan for your life. Never forget that.